Now remain standing. You know, we are privileged to travel all over the world. Some of you in the homes out there, we get to see you when we're in different nations. And we experience so many, many incredible people that God brings into our path. And I think it was about seven years ago, I was privileged to meet this incredible man that God has brought to minister to you. And really, one of my desires is that you get to experience. We all can't go all over the world. Some of us are not called to. And I'm gonna ask Alan if he would bring this gentleman up here to minister to us. And I, I want many that are, when they come through America, for the anointing they carry to be imparted. This man fits this place. He, of course, was the former vice president of Zambia. He, when you walk in faith, you're either loved or hated. The Lord was either loved or hated. He has one of the most incredible ministries, not just a church, but an incredible ministry that shifts and causes, it's called Zambia will be saved. It shifts, it helps the orphans, it helps the needy. I want you to welcome the former vice president of Zambia, Zambia Apostle Nevers Mumba. Let's welcome him here to this house. He also has one of the most wonderful wives I've ever met. Now let's thank God for what we're about to experience. Thank you so much. God bless. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, just raise your hands and let's talk to God for a few moments. Father, we thank you this morning. We acknowledge your Lordship in this sanctuary. Thank you for that which you have already done today and the lives that you have touched, destinies that you have re-engineered this morning. Thank you, Lord, for bringing my feet into this place and thank you for allowing me to tabernacle in such a wonderful atmosphere. I ask of you now, Lord, to anoint these lips of clay today as I endeavor to break the bread of life. Speak, Holy Spirit. Change. Change things in the hearts of your people. Bring them into their space of victory and success. Father, thank you for the joy that we have embraced this morning. We ask that now you may touch these lips of clay. For I ask it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. Seven years ago, Chuck Pierce visited my home in Zambia together with a close friend of mine, Emmanuel Kure. It was a visit that changed my life and that of my family forever. I was invited that there is a team that has come, a prophetic team that had come to Zambia and I was asked if I could be present. I wasn't too sure because of having been involved so deeply in the political process. But I ended up in that service where Brother Chuck was preaching together with um, Brother Kure. A few things happened and I just wanna say this before I get into the word. Somebody told me that you don't appreciate what you've got until you lose it. I don't know how you honor your servants here, but I think that through the consistent visits of Chuck and his team, Zambia is experiencing a totally new level of intimacy with God. So for me to be here today is an amazing experience. Because when they came to Zambia, and I attended that meeting, there were a number of people in that service. One of them was the former president, President Chiluba, who unfortunately died shortly after that. And they called President Chiluba to the front. They called me to the front. 
Then they called another man of God to the front, three of us, and Brother Chuck was there. Brother Kure prophesied over the former president and told him to, to put his house in order. He just told him straight to put his house in order because God was moving into another level with his life. Little did we know that he was announcing his departure and death. Shortly after that, he prophesied to many other people. When he came to me to prophesy over my life, he gave President Chaluba, um, Chuck gave him uh, a mantle and uh, he unfolded the mantle. The other preacher was given a mantle, he unfolded the mantle. When it came to me, Brother Kura said, I'm not going to, the Lord has not allowed me to prophesy over Brother Nevis. But Chuck, you are going to prophesy over this man. And so Chuck came from where he was standing and began to prophesy over my life and that of my wife. Then he took this mantle and gave it to me and he says, but don't open the mantle, your season is not yet. The Lord will show you when the season has come, then you open that mantle. It was the first time that I came into contact with such prophetic. I've been an evangelist for 30 years in my country. So that was an experience that I've never forgotten. That was seven years ago. Today, as I speak to you, is the end of that seven years. <laughs> Brother Chuck and Kure said things that the next seven years will be a transition, not only for Nevis Mumba, but for Zambia. Yeah. And after seven years, you shall see the fulfillment of what God has been wanting during this country. I come here today. Feeling, a, having that feeling that something yeah. is about to break forth. Yeah. Seven years is over, Brother Chuck. Yeah. And I need to know why I'm here this morning. Yeah. I, I really, somebody needs to help me here because seven years is over. Some of the things they said to me was that by the end of this year, there will be a new cabinet in this country. Yeah. Now, nobody says that in Africa... Because what you are implying is that the president who is sitting there is not going to be there. So there will be a new cabinet. But the two of them said there will be a new cabinet by December. And there was a new cabinet by December. Because they said, I, we see a big tree falling. Very shortly a big tree is going to fall in this nation. And there will be a new cabinet. After they left town, and glad they did, after they left town, the president died, and there was a new cabinet in December. All that scared me because I thought, if whatever these two guys say seems to be coming to pass, I don't want them to say anything to do with death over my life because i got some stuff to do. Um, then before they left, Brother Kure sat me down with, his, with my wife, and said, very soon, the president is going to appoint you into some diplomatic work. Don't refuse. My wife and I laughed, and he asked us why we laughed. We said, well, because this president and us, we differed. I was his vice president, and we differed on a foreign policy issue, and we stepped out of his government. Uh, but he said, the president is going to ask you to go overseas as an ambassador. Don't refuse, because your season is not yet. But after seven years your season will come. Now, I said, now, that's a long time. So, we thought that was the president was going to appoint us to go into, into diplomat mission because he was still alive. But I realized that it was not going to be that president. It was going to be the next president who was going to ask me to go and serve as a diplomat. And when that time came, and this new president called me to State House and said, Brother Nevis, I want you to help us as a nation. I want you to go to Canada and serve as an ambassador there. The first thing I said to him was, no, I have been, I want to stay home. I've been an evangelist ever since I was a young man, 17 years old. I began to preach all over the world. I want to settle down. I don't want to go outside my country. So then he said, and he's not a Christian, he said to me, well, why don't you go and talk to your God? So uh, I said, okay, um, I'm going to pray about this. But it, I told him I could not go out because I was tired of traveling and it's time for me to settle down. So as we were going through this, my wife and I were praying one day and then she held my hand. She said, do you remember when Chuck came here? 
They talked about some being an envoy and don't refuse. Could this be it? I said, oh my God, how did I miss that? I wanted to call the president, but he called me. He said, I want you to come, and I went to state house. He had just moved into the state house. I was the first guest from the moment he won the election. To be, I was his first guest. Then he said this to me. He said, and what did your God say to you? So I raised my hands and said, wherever you send me, I will go. And that's when he asked me if I could go to Canada. And then in the prophecy in 2008, you said that you stay there for two and a half to three years. Then your season will come to an end. And the land shall call you back. And when the land calls you back, come back. Now all that we were just writing with my wife. I went to Canada. When I landed in Lusaka, it was two and a half years to the date when I landed at the international airport coming back from Canada, right on schedule with the prophetic. Some of you might be doubting the authenticity of prophecy. I am nothing but a product of confirmation of that prophecy. So you can see that from the moment Brother Chuck came into my life, which is only seven years ago, um, he's done stuff. And I'm so glad that the Lord allowed me to meet with you. And now, I was speaking in South Africa not too long ago, last month, as a matter of fact, I'd be uh, at, um, at um, Global Business Forum, and uh, Brother Chuck was there with his team, and afterwards I got a message that if I could come and speak here uh, during this time. Now, the interesting thing is that this is the end of the seven years, and I said, okay, I'll come. I wanted to come here, not to speak. I come to Dallas, I went to Bible Squad Christ for the Nations. I served in this country for some time as a minister and we purchased a home in Rowlett. And every time I'm in a transition, I call that the Bethel. I come back there to hear God afresh. And I decided to come here because I'm in a transition now. And then uh, this invitation came. And then I said, I don't think I should be preaching during this time. but. The Lord reminded me that it is destined of me that you go. This is seven years, and if there has been any pain in my life, or any pain or any joy, but more, more pain than joy, Brother Chuck has been responsible for it. And so I have to come back here. I have to come back here and get this thing. I want to be free and just do what God wants me to do. Amen. So I'm back here and I'm glad to be here. I bring you special greetings from my own wife, Florence. And, uh, you know, we've got five children. She gave me five children in seven years. We call it the African anointing. And uh, I tell young American boys, don't, don't be in a rush to listen to my testimony. Uh, the American girl may not be agreeable to that. But uh, we had our two grandchildren. My, my, my wife is in Canada welcoming our second grandchild. So I'm glad to be here this morning. And I bring you special greetings from my country, Zambia. And once again, uh, Brother Chuck, thank you so much for inviting me to your great ministry and to see what God is doing in this great land. In Zambia, there were two names that we kept hearing and uh, I never thought I would see them in my life. And that was Dr. Wagner and Chuck Pierce. Uh, they sounded like some angels that, you know, one day if you go to heaven, you find them. And um, here we are now seeing them in Corinth, Texas. Uh, I don't know whether this is the Corinth of the Bible, but that is pretty close. And I'm so glad that in my lifetime, I've met these two, and I'm delighted to be in this place. Everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Everybody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we ready for the word of God? Yes. One thing I found out about preaching in the United States is that doesn't matter what you say in the introduction, uh, they actually time the introduction as well together with your preaching time. So once you get carried away talking about other things, uh, you'll be running into your preaching time, and once you over, 
over, if you go beyond your preaching time, that, must be, that might be the last time you preach there. So let me, for the sake of diplomacy, go back to the reason why I am here this morning. I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter number 7. The book of Genesis, the seventh chapter. And I'm reading verse 16, that I'm going to go over to um, 21, right to verse 24 of the same book. What a joy to be in this church. I mean, by the time they call you to preach, you've run five miles. I, and I tell you, this is awesome. I, I, I've been filming all this. I'm going to send it to my wife and say, anytime you want joy, come over to this church. There's plenty of it. I enjoyed every minute of it. Genesis chapter number 7, verse 16. The Bible says, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. We're talking about Noah and, his, and the ark. It's a very familiar story, but I want you to listen to this. I mean, I've come all the way from Africa. Please give me a few minutes to say something. It's a long trip, and I, I should have something to say this morning. <laughs> and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Everybody say, shut him in. I want you to take notice of that because I'm coming back to that in the next few minutes. God shut Noah in. He shut him in. He's the God of shut-ins. And sometimes we get confused when God shuts us in. And I'm talking to somebody here this morning. I have to be careful that I don't get too excited as a politician. I have to observe protocol. So the Bible says in verse 21, And all flesh died and moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, or in whose nostrils, was the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was up the first of the ground, both man and cattle, and of creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed, upon the earth and hundred and fifty days. Everybody said amen. amen. I want to speak to you this morning for the next few minutes on a message that I believe is for someone here in the house. And somehow along the way I may be able to tell my short story alongside this ministry. I want to speak to you on when God shuts you in. When God shuts you in, I believe that when God is about to do something in the world or anywhere, in the church or in your life or whatever situation it is, God has a way of preserving those that he intends to use for the next level by shutting them in and seemingly removing them from what is going on so that they can be revealed at the appropriate time. It is this experience of God's shuttings that is mostly misunderstood by the body of Christ. Because we always want to be part of the action. We don't want any scene to pass us by. We want to be the ones that people are clapping on and people are talking about. But there comes a time when God takes you out of everything and shuts you in because he has a plan for your life. I'm preaching this message because it's relevant to my life. I've gone through a lot myself and I know how painful it is to be shut in. I know how painful it is to almost feel irrelevant. Other people's names are in the newspapers. Everybody's talking about them except you. It is that patience to wait for your season 
that is totally misunderstood by the body of Christ. And I've come to town to tell somebody in this house that that shut-in is only for a season because he has to place you there in order to take you there. Can I preach it like I feel it today? And it is important for us to understand that God has a plan. And one of the most frustrating things is to be in a race with a person whose time has come. One of the most frustrating things is to run in an election with a person whose time has come. And you're also trying to run for the same seat. And sometimes it is important that we address this matter because some of you are getting discouraged because of what you're going through. You have been shut in by God, but that's only for a season. God has a plan for your life. You're forgotten and even ignored and ridiculed in the meantime. But God has a plan here today. God is about to do something not only in the United States, but I've got confidence that God wants to do something in the body of Christ in my nation. But in order for him to do that, he's got to find certain individuals that he's going to shut in to be preserved, to be prepared, and then to be promoted. He first preserves you. Then he prepares you in the preservation. Then he promotes you. And people start to say, and who is this? Where has he been? We've been toiling all day. And this guy just shows up from nowhere. No, he's not showing up from nowhere. He was being preserved for that season. We say these things. Who is he? We paid a high price and he just shows up from nowhere. When I was running for president this January, our president died. And I can tell you since Brother Chuck and Kure came to Zambia, we have lost three presidents. Now I'm wondering whether he should come again. <laughs> but I was running for president because it was just a midterm run. And you can see that because I'm here with no police, it means I didn't make it. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to make it. But the point I'm trying to say here today is that I preached the message in one of our churches in Zambia. And I said, look at this gentleman. The new president, he didn't even know he was going to be president. He was so hidden away by the former president who died. He could not even have been thought of as running for president. He just stepped in and won. When I met him a few weeks ago, he held my hands and he said, Brother Nevers, thank you so much for helping me win the election. I said, what are you talking about? So he explained his story how, you know, through my, some of the things that happened, you know, he was able to have a full vote from the Eastern province and won the election. But he never struggled for it. But he was always there, but not there. He had been put away. And when he showed up, nobody could fight him because they didn't know him. They didn't even know what to say about him. He just showed up. And within weeks, he was president. And there we were, wondering what in the world is going on. I've been trying this stuff for years. He comes for three weeks, and he's president. There comes a time when God shuts you up. And I'm talking to somebody here today. Some of you now are getting weary because some people are going way ahead of you. You seem to be in the same place. You're wondering how long, oh God? Why me? How come everybody else has a good chance except me? I've come to town to let you know and to announce that the shut-in is not permanent. God is about to open that door for your season to come. The season is knocking at the door of your ark. The waters have assuaged. And the season for you to get out of that ark is knocking at your door as I speak to you right now. And the Bible says, and when the waters assuage, only Noah was alive with those that were with him. Everybody else was gone. All the big shots were gone. All the right candidates were gone. All the rich guys were gone. And he was only standing because he had been shut in. Is it alright to preach out here? Yeah. Every 
everything else had died, everything else had withered away, but his weight was worthwhile. His shedding of tears was worthwhile because the Bible says when the waters are swayed, he was still standing and there was no competition. There was no competition. God knows how and God knows when and when your season comes, no devil from hell can stand against what God wants to do in your Somebody shout hallelujah. Your season is here, the water is assuaging and the waters are coming down and your season is knocking at the door of your ark. Rebo shandrebo seseta. Knocking at the door of your ark. And this is what I hear in the spirit this morning. That somebody's here wondering, Lord, how long? Why have I been shut up in here? It is because God is preserving you. God is preparing you so that you can be promoted. That's what the Bible is teaching us this morning. You are shut in to be preserved. While it rained, destroying the, every human being and every animal, you were preserved. You know, there's a story in the book of Acts about Pentecost in chapter number two. I like to talk about this story because it explains my concern. The day of Pentecost is not necessarily the way we interpret it. It's just a feast of Israel. And, and Pentecost was a time when nations came from all over the then known world, known world. They came from everywhere, just like Christmas. It wasn't even that religious to some of the people. They came there for business. They came over there to exchange business cards and talk about the inventions and the progress they're making in Syria and Iraq and Iran, wherever they're coming from. So Pentecost was a place of ingathering. It was a place of exchanging ideas. After Pentecost, they went back into the rest of the world where they came from. I wanted to listen to this. So Pentecost, as we know it, is, is when the Holy Ghost came and, and, and the church launched. But I want you to look at it from a business and commercial side of things. It was a place where people gathered from all over the world. What better time to do business? What better time to exchange business cards? What better time to get telephone calls and, I mean, telephone numbers and email addresses? To get Viber numbers and all that stuff. That was the time in Jerusalem when they did that. But I want you to watch this. Please watch this. And this is something to encourage you. On Pentecost, something happened because there were 120 that were gathered in the upper room. God, Jesus, I told them, you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. They sat up there. Nobody thought anything about them. Nobody even knew there were 120 people waiting out there. Everybody was busy exchanging cards. If the Jerusalem Post was going to have a headline, it was going to talk about the major deals that have been struck between business companies and, and things. Nothing said about the 120. Totally ignored. Nobody even cared about the fact that they were there. Later on, know that they were there. Every activity here, the ballroom dances and the businesses, the banquets were taking place. The newspapers and television, if there was there any television, would have been showing commerce and the, the, the activities of Pentecost. But nobody even wrote a single line that there are 120 waiting up in there. Not one. So don't, don't, don't you give up now. Don't you think your season is not coming just because nobody's writing about you. Oh, I feel something this morning. I feel it in Africa when I'm preaching. Now I'm feeling it in America too. I think this is all right. Nobody knew that anything was happening in the upper room. Nobody. Except God. They were shut in. They were shut in by God. 
for the appropriate time. The Bible says then suddenly. There's a suddenly slicking on this morning. There's a suddenly slicking on on somebody's future and somebody's life this morning. The Bible says then suddenly. Like a rush of a mighty wind. The Holy Ghost descended upon the 120. 120. And they speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you can imagine Peter coming out, drunk with the Holy Ghost to the balcony. When for the first time, people realized, oh, there were some people over there. Who are they? Where have they been? Shut in. Shut in by God. Shut in. Preserved by God. Prepared by God. Ready to be promoted by God. Shut it. So Peter comes out all drunk in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You're the ones who are talking about this Jesus. You don't understand what's that. We are not drunk with wine. But this is the power that was talked about. And I want you to to notice this. I've been in television for many years from when I was young. Uh, Can you imagine if CNN was there? If BBC was there? Al Jazeera was there? All this time, they were filming the banquets. The exchange of business cards. Business and commerce. And the feast of Pentecost. That's what they were reporting to the capitals. When all of a sudden the cameras changed. Suddenly, suddenly, there is somebody here today. There is somebody in this place today. The cameras have been away from you, but they're coming now. Suddenly. They're talking about this Jesus. They're talking about the Holy Ghost. And that's what God is about to do in your life this morning. Don't you give up right now. There is a suddenly that is knocking at the door of the ark. And it is your suddenly. Somebody shout yes. You may be lonely. You may be worried about your future and your destiny. But God has not forgotten about you. God has not abandoned you. He has preserved you. He has kept you. He has prepared you. And when the promotion comes, all hell breaks loose. I've come here for somebody. I've come here to talk to someone who thinks it's over. It's not over yet. Yes, it's quiet, but it's not over. Yes, it's been silent, but it's not over. Everybody has been overlooking you, but it's not over. Every friend of yours has been getting married, but you're not getting married because the one who's going to marry you is not compared to all these guys that have been coming around. Hey! It's not over. God knows what he is doing. He loves you enough serve you. He loves you enough to prepare you. You are not lost. There's a knock coming on your door. Suddenly. And when and when the camera is on you, when the camera is on you, that's when you introduce yourself. My name is Peter, and I'm not drunk with wine. I'm drunk with the Holy Ghost. Hey, somebody Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the camera is on you, then you can introduce yourself. Don't force your introduction. You know how hard it is to force your introduction 
no my name is so and so I I did so and so and nobody's listening nobody cares because your season is not yet it's hard to introduce yourself out of season you know what I gotta find a way to land this message so don't get standing up because you're getting me going now please sit down I need to say what I came here for but there comes a time when all of us go through this season of wondering why God everybody else is ahead of me what's going on with me everybody else is being applauded except me you have been shut in I call them God shut ins and when God has shut you in there, it doesn't matter what you do, you are shut in. You can bang on the door all you want. You know why he hasn't opened up the door? Because the waters haven't come down. The waters are still high. And he knows that. But you are so eager to get out. But God hasn't opened the door of the ark. Because the water is still there. That's the only reason you're still where you are. Some of you. I know that. <sighs> Jesus. When he was born. The magicians went over to the king and said. There's a another king being born and the king said what another king is being born now I've been vice president before I can tell you one thing for free no king wants to hear about another king in the same kingdom I don't know about America but in Africa y'all don't even look presidential when you're number two y'all better dress up in some kind of funny clothes so that you're not suspected that you want the big boss job. So, some magicians told the king and said, there's going to be another king born in your kingdom. And the decision was easy to make. Kill everybody under the age of two. Make sure nobody survives. They began to kill every child under two years old just to clear the way for this king. There can only be one king at a time. Jesus, the parents of Jesus had to do what I'm talking about. They had to be taken into a shut-in. They ended up in Egypt, shut in, until the king died. That's when they showed up and came back to Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that you are not forgotten. You are not abandoned. You have not been disappointed. You are in a shutting and there's no shutting that lasts forever. It doesn't matter how high the waters go. They are going to come down. It doesn't matter how little money you have when your season comes when your season comes the door is opened there's no competition I lost on the day I was flying to the United States I lost my elder brother he died when I was on the plane, I was thinking about him. If I learned anything from him, in 2001, I ran for president for the first time in my life and didn't make it. He came home. He found me really grieving because, you know, I said, Lord, you, you told me this. And I know some of you have asked those questions. You told me this. So what's going on? So he came to me and said, and he's not a pastor, he's not a Christian like I am, but he goes to church and he comes to me and says, Nevis, I have a little story to tell you. He said, you know, in life, there comes a time when all the handsome are going to be finished. Just stay in the line. 
It may take long, but if you can stay in the line, your friend in front gets it, you can only watch and admire. The next one gets it, you can only watch and wonder. And you trying it, but it's not working. Somebody else gets it. The second one gets it. The fourth one gets it. The fifth one. He said, before you know it, you'll be right in front. And they won't give it to anybody else but you. He said to me, stay the course. Stay the course. After having done all to stand. And I've come to Corinth to tell somebody, it's not over. It's not over. You have been shut in, but I can hear a knock on the ark. That the waters have assuaged and it's time to step out. And when that happens, you are number one in the line. Somebody shout hallelujah. You're preserved. You know, I have a story to tell about South Africa. I was preaching in South Africa not too long ago. They have an island there which they call Robin Island where Nelson Mandela was kept for 27 years. And when I was there with Brother Chuck the same weekend, a gentleman, a minister of government in South Africa died. He spoke in the same conference where Chuck and myself spoke. And little did we know, a few hours after that, he was going to die. He died in an accident. I went back to my country, flew back for his funeral. Because I just couldn't, it was amazing that somebody I spent so much time with that evening could be gone the next few hours. So I flew down, went to Limpompo district to, to bury him. And uh, when I was there, something caught my attention. That really, Robben Island has a, speci a special significance to South Africans. Anybody who had gone to Robben Island has a higher ranking than anybody else. It was a shut-in place. Wow. Well, Nelson Mandela was shut in for 27 years. When he stepped out of Robben Island, he didn't need to say anything. He didn't need to preach as hard as Never Smumba. He didn't even need to dress in a certain way. Wherever he stood... It was his season. Whatever he said was a court. Wherever he went, it was a, a, a national event. Just because he had been shut in. Maybe I can go a little further to say that the longer the shut in, the greater the glory. Because somebody's saying, yeah, but I was in prison for five years. Well, listen, we're talking 27 for a noble cause. Yeah. Shut it. The longer they shut it, the greater the glory. Is anybody listening to me today? You know, I don't care how well I preach today. If Nelson Mandela was here and he shows up here, I know what Brother Chuck is going to do. So I said, Nevers, can you just kind of sit down for a few minutes? We got somebody here who's got something to say. <laughs> And I'll argue my way through, but he's going to say, look, listen, that 27 years was not in vain. He was shut in for 27 years. The minister who died had been shut in Robben Island. That funeral was so heavily attended. I've never seen anything like that. Just because he had been to Robben Island. It's a place of shut in. Secondly, you're shut in to be prepared. Moses when he messed up and killed an Egyptian, he ran off and went to Midian and met his wife there, given to him by the Midianite. You remember that he was shut in in Midian for as long as God was sorting out business in Egypt. He could not get him back there until the season of shut in had come to an end. The Bible says, and I love this, and I'll move on because I don't want, this is another message. The Bible talks about when the season came, the moment to break out of your shutting. He, there's always something that happens when your shutting time is over. Moses was looking after his father-in-law's sheep when all of a sudden there was a fire burning. 
Now, I, have an, an, I, I thought if God wanted to talk to Moses, he could have sent him an email or, or just given him a call or something. Why does he have to do what he did? The Bible says there was a fire burning. And the bush was burning. And as he tried to go close, the bush talked. Now, somebody told me when they heard me preach in one of my crusades in Zambia, they thought I was going to die because I was preaching my lungs out. I was just having a blast. And somebody said, never calm me down. Don't, don't get too excited about this stuff. Just preach like my pastor preaches. I said, listen, I don't know how his shut-in was broken. Uh, but when a bush talks to you, um, there, there is a feeling that this thing is not funny. Uh, that when, when the bush, I said, have you, has the bush ever talked to you? If a bush talks to you and you preach normal, then you are abnormal. Because when a bush talks, that should wake you up. <laughs> and it woke Moses up. And his ministry was not ordinary from that moment. And I want to tell you today, he was being prepared by his father-in-law to be able to do what God has in store for him and take the children of Israel out of bondage. Everyone say, shut in. Shut in. Say, shut in. Shut in. I, I want to move on because time is not with me. Then we see that once you've been shut in to be preserved, then you're shut in to be prepared. The third thing that remains is you're shut in to be promoted. And that's why I came here today. It's the only reason I came here today. Because promotion time has come. Promotion. Not just for you as individuals. Not just for you as individuals. But for this ministry. If you are taking steps like this. You're going to take moon steps now. Because when promotion comes. Nobody can hold you back. When the door is open, nobody can hold you back. When the ark is open, nobody can compete with you. Because you are the only one in town. Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo. It's the last point, so I want you to be seated and listen to this. I know how clever you are, Americans. When you want me to stop, you stand up. I'm not stopping right now. This is too good. Shut in to be promoted. Joseph, Genesis 39, verse 20. Then you go to chapter 41 and verse 9. We read the story of Joseph. We know it. Let me shortcut it. Go over to the house of Potiphar. And this royal woman with gold and silver and bracelets falls in love with the houseboy. And uh, accuses him that he's after me and ends up in jail in the prison of the king. We know the story of Joseph. He was shut in in the prison. He helped others and they took off and forgot about him. He was shut in. He was shut in. Then the man, the Bible says, then that man whose dream had been interpreted for him remembered Joseph. Uh, there's a remembering going on right now. You know, what I'm preaching today does not make sense to somebody who is just looking at life as life. I, I want you to understand, I've been there so many times myself. When it looks impossible, when it looks like nobody even remembers your name, they don't even respond to your texts. When you call, they never call you back. I'm here for you. I've come here for you. You sent too many texts. You have sent too many phone calls. Too many Viber messages. But nobody is answering you back. The water is still assuaging. Don't worry about it. Keep, keep, keep sending them if you want. If you've got time and money on it, keep sending. But when your season comes, and I've come here all the way from Zambia to announce to somebody 
that a phone call is coming. As early as Tuesday, you're going to get a phone call. And that phone call will change your life for me. The doors of the ark are now open. The doors of the ark are now open. And there's no competition. Somebody say yes. A phone call is on its way. It may read private, but answer it. Because by now you're weary. You don't expect anything, but this one coming on Tuesday, answer it. Hello. Meet me at such and such a place. Your Robin Island season is over. Your board season is over. Your upper room shut in is over. Your ark shut in is over. Joseph's prison shut in is over. And let me now tell you what God does to challenge your enemies and those who have always sung songs against you. God has a sense of humor when the doors are opened. And this is what's going to happen. Now I know that we need to go home and have lunch. But here is what I want to say. Turn with me to the book of Esther, chapter number 5. Esther, Esther, when your season has come, he is going to use your opponent to set up your inauguration preparations. Listen to this. Esther, chapter number 5, verse 14. Very quickly. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hung thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the king, the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Now, I have to be quick here because this is something that all of you are aware of. Story goes, Haman was almost number two in the kingdom to the king. But there was a, there was a Jew there by the name of Mordecai who was a pain to him. Everybody stood up and saluted. But this Mordecai never stood up for Haman. Because he believed that he can only salute God of Abraham. And he was not going to be saluting any guy who comes in claiming to be vice president. So Haman was upset with him. Shared with his evil wife, Zeresh. And Zeresh said, take him out. You got power. Do Dig a, a trench here and, uh, and so that you can throw him here and go to the king and ask for his life and he'll give it to you. Listen to this. <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit, how do I put this? Then, by the inspiration of God, Esther invites the king and Haman for dinner, for a banquet. Very happy. He goes over there. They dig the trench and, the, uh, and what they wanted to, uh, to, to use to kill Mordecai, to hang him in there. Now, as he was going to the banquet, to, to, to go over there and report himself, he had already dug a hole where they were going to hang Mordecai. That night before the banquet, something supernatural happened. And this is the message I want to leave with you in Corinth. Chapter 6 of Esther and verse 1 says, On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of a Bithana and Teresh, Two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, 
And the king said, what honor and dignity has been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman was already in the court. They said, Haman is in the court. They said, call, he said, call Haman. Haman was ready to kill Mordecai. The hole had already been dug to hang him there. Then the king asked Haman, what should be done for a man who saves the king? Haman thought, who else is he talking about but me? Get the best horse that you use, your majesty. Get the crown that you yourself wears, your majesty. Put it on him. And let him visibly march through the streets and proclaim this is what is done to a man who saves the king. Then the king said, Haman, rise up now and do what you have said for Mordecai. He's going to use your enemy to plan your victory. He's going to use your enemy to plan your inauguration. He's going to use those fight. Somebody say yes. Haman planned the inauguration. For Mordecai, I've come to Corinth to tell you that you have been shut in, but I hear the knock. The days of your shutting are over. And the ones who are going to work on your victory are those who have fought you all these years. Victory has come to town in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a big hand, somebody. Praise him. My God. Only God could have orchestrated today. Some of you, this is for political people in days ahead. This message is for you. Some of you, you have been destined to be at home. You have been set aside, some as short as three weeks, some as long as three years. And the Lord says, I have brought you this message. Some of you have been pressing through and you've said, Lord, have you just forgotten where I'm at? I have a word for you. And this word I heard the Spirit of God say today, the camera is about to turn. Some of you will be seen in a way this week you've never been seen before. I'm going to ask Barbara, Melinda, Rebecca, and Keith if you'll come up here with Alan and Peter and I. Apostle God brought you here today. He brought you here for us. He brought you here for people all over that will hear this message. But he brought you here for you also. And... Here's a word from the Lord, and then Peter and I are going to put the new mantle on you. The Lord told me to write you another check because you're going to take an unexpected trip. Get ready. The Lord says the provision is always already there. When that comes and you know you have to go, you have to go immediately. So the Lord says, get ready. It's going to be unexpected from what you would have thought. But a trip is coming. It's not just back to Zambia. It is a destined trip that unlocks your future. Now I'm going to ask Peter to come. Our life changed when Peter took a trip to Nigeria. It changed my life. It caused a whole continent to open up. You were a part of that change. 
And so I think it's very appropriate that Peter and I put the new mantle on you that God has for right now. And then we have prophets all in this house and that know nothing about you until you got here today that will prophesy to you. This is the mantle for the year that we're in. Alan's wife designed it. We had it made. It represents the whirlwind of the past becoming the center of the glory for the future. The Lord says the whirlwind of your past is now going to recenter you for the future. Now, if you'll turn around and face the audience, we're going to put this on you. I'm going to have Peter pray over you apostolically, and then we're going to prophesy to you. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and I thank you for our brother. I thank you for the word that you have given him. I thank you, Lord, that his word is changed, has changed lives now here in this room and on the webcast. And I thank you, Father, for the ministry that he has. And now I say that, uh, that new doors are going to open for him. That these do when these doors open, you will move forward in them. They will be doors that you have not anticipated. And you said that you would like to settle down in Zambia. This is not the word of the Lord for you. The word for the, of the Lord for you is a continental word and a global word. God has wonderful plans for you, and he will fulfill them, and you will, you will reach every part of the destiny, of the destiny that God has planned for you from the foundation of the world. So I take the apostolic authority that I have, and I commission you to move forward by the leading of God as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a representative of the kingdom of God, and that kingdom will be extended here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now for many of you out there, when you're in a moment like this, that God has ordained sovereignly. Where he spoke it seven years ago, he just moved you into it. Now hear what I'm saying to you. Some of you live in time. You think everything is about you yesterday. You think it's about you today. He just moved you into a sovereign moment that was spoken seven years ago. That means everything that's going on right now affects you some way. Every witness that is on the web right now, he's moved you into this moment. Every one of you that will hear this over the next three weeks, he has moved you into this moment. Now I'm going to ask the prophets to speak. Rebecca, you start and then let Barbara and Keith and Melinda, Alan, any of you. And then I have a very specific word God spoke to me this morning. For the Lord would say to you that you have a voice that is called to this hour and that your voice is going to be uh, projected onto a larger audience that you have you have pursued and you have stood in a political arena and that that arena is going to flip and that as it flips you're going to see oh. how your voice is going to speak to an audience that you did not know you could reach with your voice. And before you began to preach this morning, when I looked at you, I heard the Lord say, I have put a Joseph anointing upon you. Keith's the, been over during the service and said, Joseph has come into the house. Oh, oh. 
uh, and, and, and I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm going to begin to give you such revelation in this hour. I'm going to give you such strategy. For the Lord said, from the time you were a young boy, you had an ability to take a little and cause it to become much. And I'm going to give you an ability and a strategy to cause little to become much. For I say, I'm going to put keys in your hand that will begin to unlock entire uh, territories and entire nations uh, to unlock wealth. Uh, I'm going to give you the ability to break the spirit of poverty that has caused a people to be captured so that they could not break out. The Lord said there is a fresh new Joseph mantle that is upon you. And so the Lord just says, I've taken you through times where you did not have so that I could teach you how to overcome lack and poverty and bring you into a place that you could release wealth into the hands of my people. So no, their new Joseph anointing is upon you. Do not hold back for I will give you a voice. I say I'll even cause you to begin to expose corruption says the Lord. I'll cause you to begin to see A new see administration the say it. And I say you will uh, you will eradicate the corruption that is there so that my people can step into the blessings of the Lord. A new Joseph mantle has come upon you. And with that, I heard Proverbs 29, 3, where it says, When the righteous rule, the city rejoice. The Lord says this day, son, that not just the city, but the globe will rejoice. For my voice will resound with a sound of kingdom. It will cause a turnaround. It will cause a shift. He said, For this moment have I prepared you to now step out of Africa, but allow Africa to be seen as the place that I've called it. He said, Think it not strange that he brought you here on this side seventh year for it completes one season but it begins another he says the righteous now stand up and they will see a seed out of Africa that they've not witnessed before but it'll set a course for the righteous to move and it'll cause other nations to see the turning the turning the turning of time over that continent in Jesus name mm. When you walk now, as up Keith's on, prophesying, I want James, if he would come up and yeah. get in place. Yeah. There's a song yeah. over you yeah. that God says, I'm going to loose the new song at the end that will break the old cycle. Yeah. Mm. When you walked up on this platform and I was sitting down front, I saw a book open behind you. And I saw when the book opened that you were standing right between the pages. And I said, Lord, reveal to me what you're showing me today. He said, look to the left and you will see that chapter 7 has ended. But look to the right and you will see that chapter 8 is beginning. Put your hand on somebody out there. Tell them the same thing. This is a word from God. And and then I said, Lord, let me see chapter 7. And the wind came down and blew the pages back. And when it did, I saw Joseph standing there. I saw a pit. I saw slavery. I even saw the seduction of the political arena come down and try to ensnare you. I saw it capture. I saw the jail cell. And I saw the jail cell again. And I said, Lord, what are you showing me today? And he said, truly, my son, I have brought Joseph to the end. And as, as he gets before me and gives thanks for all things, I will bring him out, bring him up, and set him over all things. He said, but before you release it, look at his lap. And I looked down at your lap and I saw twins and I saw one sitting on right leg and I saw one sitting on the left leg. He said, 
said he has a quiver of five, but I'm giving him a quiver of seven. And he said the quiver of seven will be a completeness to an old administration in this nation because when I get ready to birth, look to the eight page and you will see Esther because when Esther came in, I overthrew a spirit of self-exaltation. The king was feeling generous and gave her up to half of his kingdom. A new authority came down and there was a signet ring that was placed on her hand. But he said, I did it then and I'm doing it with Joseph. I'm doing it with Esther to save a people group in Jesus' name. Whoa. Hear, O Zambia, hear, Africa, hear the earth. I have released the breath of my spirit into Zambia even today. And the strength of that sound is increasing in that land. He says, hear, O nations of Africa, there is a new sound blowing through your land. And the world is eager to hear it. And the world will receive it and will respond in Jesus' name. So the Lord says to you, I've called you to a new council, a new administration. Not only will you be placed on a new council, but you will be establishing a new administration. This administration will have strategy over the next seven years and seven years again. I say to you, I will send you to face off that which faces against you the Lord says do not fear facing off for it will unlock the entryway in to the new administration that I have for you this is your day of change and you are going over every wall that tried to block you the Lord says to you there are secret doors in your walls and if you will look at your walls and say I am coming through the doors that you've been looking for will open up so it is not just Zambia that I'm giving you I am opening up a new council for a new future and you will rule in a new administration saith the Lord if your enemies don't bow I'll remove them and the ones that bow I will make them a step stool for you to go over the wall this is a word from God and the Lord said but even right now get ready the ones that bow turn around and lift them over where they was the enemy last season they will be in covenant with you this season and even last season where it was cursed this season will be blessed last season where it was a drought this season the rains will come hear the word of the Lord some of you have been shut in some of you have been postponed but God says to you watch me move on your behalf now for this is a day you have been thinking in one dimension but I have a whole new plan you'll take the assignment I give you but in your next assignment I will develop a whole new arena to bring you out and use you in a new way. The day of breaking through out of the shut-in has now come. James, if sing you, over us. You need to make your way up front right now. There is an anointing here. If that is you, run to the altar. I am telling you, God is starting new administrations. It's been going on all day. God says today you will start seeing a movement toward the next place of your service, your administration, your council. I have 
have chosen you in a new way this hour. Let's worship now, James wait a Singover. Chuck, I want you to lay hands on Peter. The yeah. Lord showed me something. Y'all send your hands to him. When he stepped up here and I walked beside him, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, the death of the last place is not coming on him in this house. Listen to me. God Extend your hands to him. I saw that there were people that were so angry that you made a move. They would rather see you drop dead than your latter years be fulfilled. Now, I want to tell you something. Not on our watch. Not on my watch. Listen to me. Extend your hands. Because the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, I've always had a plan for you. I took you to a barn on a starry night that was not the manger, but started a destiny with you and your wife. I don't know what that means. But when I saw it, I saw a heaven of stars swirl and come down. And you left a house that that you left, the jealousy of the latter of the former house wants to rise up against the latter house. Not today. Whoa. Stand your hands. Because your latter years will be greater than your former years. God has called you to have a long and happy, prosperous life. The fulfillment of the stars over you are shifting this day. And the Lord said, receive the breath of God because you will breathe in a new way. And the Lord says this trip is different from other trips. I'm going to start doing something in you. I'm going to give you a strategy. I'm going to, you're going to hear a new assignment. The Lord says this new time for the next three years for you has now begun. Look at somebody. Give them a shout. Now James... The Spirit of God, James is fixing to release over us. The Spirit of God's fixing to start hitting you. Listen to me. Pay attention. Pay attention. Link with the one next to you. But pay attention because the Spirit of God is coming down right now in Jesus. Bob, name. the Lord says, start prophesying. There's a prophetic gift that's always been in you. Start prophesying and you. You will see people creating new structures for new seasons. Same back right here with the Argentine fella. The Lord says to you, this is the day that I'm going to start using you in a new way. Get ready. I'm going to break you through. I'm going to break you out and break you into a new place. The Lord says there is a call being extended. Hear the sound that God God is bringing. All of it. your house will now open. I see someone in the distance walking on the water coming towards our boat. Oh, I see Someone in the distance walking on the water, coming towards our home. And I remember the story in the Bible. They were on the waters, afraid, and they thought they saw a ghost. But I see in this hour, he's raising up.
Scott Garber will be in the arbor to discuss where he is and why he's running for city council in Corinth. Don't forget 4 p.m. today at the center stage up at Jazz Fest. God is moving in a new way. Let's give a shout. Have James sing over us one more time, though. James, sing over us one more time. orchestrated for you. He said, you haven't heard the come that I call. You haven't understood the waves you can walk on. You haven't understood how I can settle your boat. Get ready. There is someone coming towards your boat. And where you've been Shut in. Now there's an opening. Oh, yeah, I can walk upon the walls. And yeah, I can rise above the waves. And yeah, I can walk towards the one who's calling. I will walk. I will walk upon this water. Oh. Tell somebody you don't have to sing. I can walk upon the waters. And yeah, I can rise above these waves. And yeah, I will go to the one who's calling. I can walk upon these waters. I will walk. Submit in it. I will fix my eyes on Jesus. I will fix my eyes on Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. There's things you haven't seen, He will uncover this week. Father, we ask you, seal today in our hearts. Put your hand on your heart. Lord, thank you. You are visiting this place. We receive the change ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.